Hello and welcome to The Review, the podcast where we sit down with your favorite Kendama players over a cup of coffee and dive deep into this game we all love called Kendama. Because Kendama is more than just a ball in a cup. I'm your host, Adam, and today I'm extremely, extremely excited. And I say this all the time, but seriously, very excited today to bring on a close friend, longtime supporter of The Review, and company owner, Jacob Call, on to The Review. This is one of my greatest friends in the Kendama community. He's been running New Laced Kendama, a brand new Kendama company to 2020 for the past year and a bit, I think, or we'll get into more of those details soon, I'm sure. Uh, and it's a veteran owned company that is doing some really cool stuff with an incredible shape and an incredible design. So I'm really excited to dive into his early journey of starting one of the newer, more popular Kendama brands in the space. Uh, alongside that, though, we're going to be drinking coffee, and you guys know that we have a sponsor here on the show, and if you can't tell, we'd be repping them today. This is Onyx Coffee Lab. They're an Arkansas-based roaster, and they are generously supporting the review, and I am very excited to have them on board because they are one of my favorite roasters. I was a big fan of them before they joined the show, and I am still a big fan of them today since they've joined the show. They change the coffee industry. They don't cut costs. They don't do any of those things. They're a high ethical, high standard, and very high quality coffee brand. And I recommend you go check them out. Head to onyxcoffeelab.com. And if you do decide to buy anything or subscribe, make sure you use that code BREWVIEW10 to let them know that we sent you there. We, the royal we, me. There's no one else here. It's just me. Let them know I sent you. Use code BREWVIEW10 or click the link in the description of this episode. And you can go and get some great coffee while supporting this show that I hope you love. And if you do love this show, also head to iTunes or Spotify, wherever you listen, and make sure you hit follow or leave a review. That really does help the show grow and reach new people and larger audiences. With all that said, let's get Jacob on here and dive into this week's episode of The Review and answer some of your questions as well. Jacob, let's get going. Hey, guys. Jacob, welcome here to The Review. Thank you for having me. This feels like a, a long time coming. You and I have been good friends for, for far too long for me to have put this off. Yeah, you know, I was starting to feel left out of the club. No. <laughs> big beef. Uh, yeah. No, um, I'm super excited. Obviously, I've been a super big fan of the review. Uh, I love everything that you do here. So for me, it's like a dream come true to come on and talk to you. Hey, man, I am equally excited. Uh, we, we got three warm-up questions that we usually try to jump into uh, pretty quickly here. Uh, we want to know what you're drinking and if you could teach one person their first bike past or present, who would it be? And who's the most inspiring player to you today? But let's, uh, let's break it down one by one. Uh, what are you drinking today, Jacob? So today I have this, uh, there's like a roaster that I've been liking a lot. It's called Volcanica. seems like they vote, like grow like a lot of stuff in the volcanic regions of the world. Um, so today I have a Dominican brew, which is really good. It, it basically just tastes like strawberries. It's amazing. Just the brew alone, black coffee, you'll get the biggest hint of strawberries. Um, and I'm I, a New Englander. I put a little milk in there too. <laughs> oh, come on, Jacob. I thought I trained you right. <laughs> let, let, let's let the record show for a second. Uh, Jacob, you got into coffee more seriously. I don't know if you were much of a coffee drinker beforehand, but you got into this kind of like specialty <clears throat> coffee range in part due to, due to my influence. Is this, is yes. this correct? <laughs> Yeah, a hundred percent. So I started watching the review and you're always like using the AeroPress and I'm like, all right, I got to try one. So I buy an AeroPress, I bring it home and I put some regular grounds in it the first time. And even that I was like, holy crap, this is better. <laughs> and so from there, I just kept experimenting and looking for different roasts that weren't stuff you can just find in a store. Um, even looked at a lot of the local roasters and seeing if I could pick up their beans. Um, and for, you know, I would say over a year, Every single morning I make a cup in my AeroPress and I haven't changed. I threw my drip coffee maker out. <laughs> so uh, if it wasn't for Adam, I would not be in this amazing coffee uh, journey. And, and do you regret it at all? No, not at all. <laughs> I know. You hear uh, that, I've listeners been... of the preview? Get into better coffee. <laughs> I've been tagging you in that leaderboard thing because I thought it would be something cool we could do together. Uh, I... <sighs> different coffee flavors and tasting them. No, learning all the notes, expanding your palate, you know. <laughs> I know. I, I genuinely really wanted to do it. I kind of hoped that they would reach out to me and be like, hey, would you would you be willing to promote <laughs> us and we'll just send you the coffee? And I was like, yes, I would. <laughs> but it, right. it's pretty expensive. It's like a hundred and some dollars per season, which on, honestly is not that expensive. It's just like, right. then I have to commit to doing it. And I already am trying to find an extra hour in every day that I have to do something fun. <laughs> and, right. And that, that though that seems fun, 
my only time to do that would be in the evenings and I don't really want to drink a lot of caffeine in the evenings because then that ruins my next day and it's just right. like a it's a it's a lot of not fun for me <laughs> you know it might be you know also it might it just get in the way because now you have this amazing sponsor Onyx Coffee Labs and you need to make sure that you're taking care of them and and tasting all of their amazing products it's, first it's true. It's true. Uh, I've actually been doing these little giveaways on my stories for Onyx gift cards. Cause so to, to put the record straight, I'm not, it's not a paid sponsorship. They're not paying me money to do this. They're giving me a referral code. That's very generous. Uh, and I just genuinely love supporting them a lot. And basically like if people purchase or click through my link or these sorts of things, I get a kickback in terms of like free coffee essentially. So the more that I promote and the more that people buy, I get free bags of coffee. It's great. I'm not going <laughs> to complain, but I'm literally, you guys, listeners of the review, you guys are nuts. You guys are animals and have been supporting like crazy. And there is so much coffee to go around that I've been giving away like free Onyx coffee to people, like just gift cards essentially to go and <laughs> use. So uh, I think there were like two people a week and a bit ago that I gave 25 bucks out to. And I'm going to have to do that again because I still have like probably like five or six bags of this coffee here. And it's all so good. And I don't want to order new stuff. So I'm at like $150, $200 of like in-store credit right now that I can use some, somewhere around there. And that's a, that's a lot of coffee. But what I'm hoping, here's what I'm hoping. I hope that they, they put on an espresso machine on their website and then we're going to we're going to hold out. We're going to stack our cash and we're going to get an espresso machine for free. Mm, mm. That would be pretty sick. You're going to do it, dude. Uh, and you guys heard it here first. Adam gets paid in coffee. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really am a simple man to please. <laughs> but yeah, man, I, I'm really excited about Onyx. They're really great people. I'm hoping to get one of them on the show uh, this year to talk a little bit more about their brand and kind of do a brand feature for them at some point. Uh, but that's not happening today because today we got our boy Jacob on here from New Lays Kandama and we all want to know not only what he's drinking, uh, but we also want to know if he could teach any one person their first spike, past, present, alive or dead, who would it be? You know, I thought about this question a lot because I obviously knew it was coming uh, and I had such a hard time and it, it got to like the second and third questions kind of like mashed for me a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I guess there's there's so many amazing players and stuff out there. Um, I guess in the Kendama world, I would say whoever is Mr. Flox, because that guy doesn't have gravity. There's no such thing as gravity. Whatever he's doing, it's amazing. Um, so if I could teach him a spike just to watch that progression over time. So what you see him doing now, I mean, wow, that'd be just very fulfilling. I think he's definitely one of the most innovative players in the community that is still pretty under the radar. Like... And, and maybe that's just because geographically he's in a different part of the world from most of the Kenoma players here in America that we kind of forget that a lot of the mm -hmm. European Kenoma players exist sometimes. Um, yeah. But they're so amazing. And Mr. Flox is incredible. Uh, it would be super cool to meet him and A, to teach him his first bike. I always think uh, it would be fun to teach like pros their first bike because then you kind of get to mm -hmm. wear that as a badge. Uh, yeah. Kind of like... Um, uh, Oh, Professor like Slughorn, dad. Professor Slughorn from, from uh, Harry Potter. I don't know if you've seen Harry Potter. You yeah. Know the, you know Harry the guy, Potter. he has like his like shelf of all of these students that he's taught and trained <laughs> and he like, and those are like his prized pupils and he just collects mm -hmm. students basically. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what I want to do. I want to collect first spikes of pros. That'd be really <laughs> good. Uh, get a bunch of badges, put them up everywhere. Yeah, it would look I really taught cool. Bonzatron his first spike. <laughs> oh man, that's like changing half the Kendama world. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. So really, if you know, if I if I if that were true, I would be the real Bonzatron. <laughs> we can make a rumor right now, and people. <laughs> yeah. No. Did you hear Cafe Kendama <laughs> taught Bonzatron his first spike? Yep, I heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, who's the most inspiring player to you today? Oh man. Um, Definitely. So I came from like a skateboarding background. So I really look at people just like I looked at skaters, like pro skaters. And um, we lost him. After a slight disturbance from a phone call from one of Jacob's friends, we are back. Uh, I'll ask you the same question here again, Jacob. Who is the most inspiring player to you today? So I do think of uh, Dama players like I think of skateboarders and just um, I really vibe with people's style. Um, and I think the most influential style that I've seen so far for me personally was uh, Wybray. Um, just 
everything he does with the consistency, it, it's insane. Just watching, watching him throw these like quad down spikes and like every single time it's perfectly timed. Amazing. I think uh, that was probably one of the most inspiring players to me. And then a caveat, um, someone who kept me pushing through Kendama on my personal journey was definitely uh, Mateo. Uh, we know him as Mateo Potato or the Burb King himself. Um, if it wasn't for learning all of those stalls, I probably would have put Kendama down pretty quickly. But that really kept me pushing as like a way to progress um, and made me fall in love with different areas of Kendama. Were stalls kind of the unlocking key to Kendama for you? Where you were like, oh, I, I really like this genre of play and that's where it became serious mm -hmm. for you? Yeah, um, I really wasn't into a lot of the string flow stuff and mm -hmm. I didn't have the hand coordination yet to juggle and do late kens and uh, instas and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. um, stalls were, and I, I think I see that even with some of the younger players too. You see a lot of younger players who get really honed at stalls quick. And I think it's just one of those things where it's very... Um, challenging and rewarding once you get it and it really shows you that there is like a wider uh, breadth of what you can do with kendama mm -hmm. interesting yeah when i started playing i i didn't do stalls hardly at all i was terrible at them i could hardly lighthouse i could hardly lunar but to, for you know to, to give myself to give myself some credit uh to give yourself some credit i was playing an old kaizen or like this the clear thomas and stuff like that so like it was hard so i i would i just did string flow and cups that's like all i did when i started i have like two edits up on youtube somewhere in the archives of who knows where <laughs> that are just like me doing like baseball bat tap to like hand roll and stuff like dumb <laughs> cup trick flow stuff i never even end on spikes <laughs> but uh, that, that was what unlocked it for me the moment that I learned that I could like keep the kanama in motion perpetually and never mm -hmm. let that stop that was that was what it was for me was I just like found this unlocking tool that I could always be playing no matter what like it could always stay in motion stalls and stuff always felt like too much of a like stop and go mm -hmm. stop and go whereas string flow it's like I can just keep this thing flying all day long yeah and I loved that I about guess string I guess maybe that kind of relates back to skateboarding too, because skateboarding is not always so flowy. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. if you're riding bowls or park or something like that, but like I grew up as a street skater. So it's a lot of like trial mm -hmm. and error. It's a lot of hard slams, you know? You gotta um, hit that ledge, hit that one trick, mm -hmm. go for that, yeah. And even in the sense of like how I think of like tricks and building those, you know, like skateboarding, say you're doing grinds, you know, you can flip in, grind, flip out. And I kind of think of that the same way when I'm building my own Kendama lines mm -hmm. and stuff like, you know, can flip into a stall and then like, you know, can flip out of the stall to something else. Um, so yeah, I, I draw a lot of parallels between the two and I definitely find uh, Kendama's like skateboarding for me now that I'm old and too beat up to, <laughs> to be able to skateboard like I want to. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I feel that I get that. Cool. Well, hey, Jacob, uh, let's let's dive in here. I want to know a little bit about your journey. Uh, I know you and I have talked a little bit before and I know a bit of your journey, but honestly, I feel like I feel like I know more than I do. And so I'm really excited to kind of dive in a little bit more and get some more background details because, uh, you know, loosely, I know that you're a veteran uh, with the U.S. Mm -hmm. military, and that was part of the original initiation of starting the company. <clears throat> I know that that played a role in it for you, but uh, talk to me about what your life was like before Kinama. What were you doing aside from being in the military and catch us up to that? Yeah, so I was in the military for uh, seven years uh, as an infantryman, and I deployed with a unit that I was with um, from Germany. When I came home, um, I went through a lot of like personal struggles and stuff like that with uh, PTSD and mental health and trying to like keep myself on the right track. Um, and eventually I found uh, college and um, started just going to school and stuff like that. But with that being a veteran, like I would only go into classes like two days a week, you know, like that was the extent of days that I actually had to be in person. So I had a lot of free time. And so I started looking for hobbies. And my first hobby was beer. Um, so I got really big into collecting rare beers. Um, and eventually a group that I was kind of like really involved with asked me if I would, or it was kind of openly asking like, can anybody do artwork? We need to make glasses. Hmm. And uh, so I decided to do that. And the glassware world, glass, eh, glassware world, led me into working as an artist for a brewery. Um, and during my time at the brewery, one of the uh, assistant brewers was always playing with the Kandama. He was always posting these crazy dirty finger lines on his story and stuff and being a skater and like seeing how this all was like 
controlling an object in space, uh, I needed to try it. <laughs> um, Super cool. And so, so you, that really you were working me. at a at a brewery though. Yeah, I was working as an artist at a brewery and going to school full time. Um, I always say like school is my main job because you know with with the VA and, VA and everything like they pay me to go and pay for my tuition. So I just consider it my job right now until I'm finished. Yeah. How many years left do you have? Uh, two. So I just got into my master's program, and once oh. I finish this, I'll be able to uh, be I'll be done with school finally, and I can get certified and then go work with disabled veterans. That's amazing. Uh, what are you taking in school? Like, what is what are you doing for your master's? So my undergrad was in psychology, but my mm -hmm. master's I'm pivoting. I did like a lot of psych and social work mm -hmm. um, classes, and so for my master's I'm pivoting to vocational rehabilitation counseling. So it's working with disabled populations and finding them like supports, finding them like meaningful work. And sometimes, um, like in my case, I'm actually a voc rehab um, attendee right now. Like I'm in that program, oh, wow. um, and. The support that they found me was continuing my education through college because that'll mm -hmm. get me the better job in the long run and secure kind of what the future for me. Mm -hmm. And so I have such an amazing counselor um, and just seeing all the stuff he gets to do and seeing how he gets to use psychology and social work mm -hmm. kind of simultaneously and work with these veterans. Uh, I talked to him a lot about it and finally like I was like this is what I have to do. So I finally just uh, pushed towards towards doing that so hopefully uh two more years and i'll get to do what i finally want to do that's really cool man congratulations and uh keep working at it i think from from what i know of you you will rock that uh you're very patient with people you're a great communicator and you know how to speak to people where they're at and and clearly right you respect people you know how to understand them and i mean this is me speaking from our conversations that we've had and also just like me speaking as someone who sees you speaking to a broader community around you. You know how to control your voice in a way that people can listen to it and hear it and be heard. Mm -hmm. And that that's kind of a rare gift that not everybody has. Thank you. <laughs> so I think, I think you'll do well there. Uh, that's, that's really exciting. Is that what you always wanted to do or what did you want to do pre-military? Um, so pre-military, uh, I had like a very just terrible past. <laughs> I had like a, not a great family and like not a lot of support. The military is really like my way out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what changed my mentality to be like, it's not about cutting corners, just do things the right way. Hard work is gonna pay off. Like, you know, the, the general kind mm -hmm. of views you would think of like a soldier. Um, I really took those to heart. And in doing so, it really helped me out through my life. Um, before the military, I really didn't have a plan. And even in the military, I didn't have a plan of what to do after. It was really when I got out and noticed that like, I would have a lot of my peers, like other sergeants that I was served with that are now out who would call me and have all these issues or like ex-soldiers who, um, and this is a true story, would like call me in the middle of the night crying with a gun and like drunk. And I'm trying to like talk them down on the phone. And that really hit hard. Um, I lost a couple of friends to suicide post service um, and in drug and uh, substance abuse. And so like, I just thought like, one of the reasons why a lot of people don't like the VA is because you're not working with someone who understands. Mm -hmm. And I have this opportunity to push through my own problems um, and get to that point so I can help so much of these guys because I was doing it kind of off the books anyways. And I figured if I can do it and make a, um, make, you know, a big change here, then imagine if I had uh, the right supports behind me to get this done. Wow, that's incredible. Wow, R really stoked for you, man. Uh, and and that's really like honorable work too, right? That's work that you can go home and be proud of. You know, you're you're getting to, yeah. to change people's lives and, and do do something really really cool. Uh, and I don't imagine it to be easy either. Like you have to be that mm -hmm. person that kind of like hears all of these burdens and bears them for these people and works with through them with them. And I mean, there's a part of me that like loves that, right? I love getting in the mess of, of whatever's going on around me. I love being involved, but not for the sake of just being involved in the mess, but to be that person that gets to help pull something beautiful out of that mess and, and to mm -hmm. draw something out of that. And, and that's really been like what I love to do is take something that's chaotic and bring something really nice out of that. And so I love working in messy organizations or messy businesses or messy mm -hmm. people's lives and, and working with them to, to turn them around and, and do something with it. So that's amazing, man. That, that really resonates. Yeah. That's there's definitely cool. like a, a good area too, where there's like um, some empathy burnout, you know, mm -hmm. dealing with a lot of these issues and I get very invested. Um, it's just how I am. Um, and I really want to solve these issues for people. And so I bring it, 
I don't bring it home with me, but I mentally bring it home with me. You know, I'm, I'm always thinking, I'm always kind of still burdened by it as if it's my problem. So I do understand that uh, one of my things that I, one of the strengths I need to work on is uh, learning how to be able to take that hat off at the end of the day and just like decompress myself. Um, and just really quickly, I don't want to dive too deep, but you know, you're talking about um, loving to help people and stuff like that. There's this theory of the wounded healer. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. And essentially it kind of goes that um, you're somebody going through your own struggles and pain and stuff like that. And in, t- in the acts of helping others mm. uh, through their pain and through their struggle, you're able to kind of find some solace and to work through a lot of your own issues. And I truly feel like that. Um, the work that I've been doing and even in school and stuff, it really ch- changed my mind- mentality to be a better, more accepting person. Like you're saying, um, I really try to meet people where they are. And, and in doing so, I try to remove my own bias about what I think they should be or where they should be and just accept them for where they are and try to help from that point. Yeah, I resonate with that. I feel like that's a lot of my own, my own like personal therapy that, that I would do for myself is like for me to help accomplish or overcome the things that I need to overcome or accomplish. Uh, it's often easier for me to help someone else with that and then to learn through that process and then internalize that process for myself and then, and then overcome that that way so i I really resonate with that and i've never heard anyone put words to it in terms of like giving that like a title the wounded healer yeah look it up i think you'll be really interested in the more uh read about it you'll definitely be more interested in it 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 always sits like every time i read it i'm like is this about me (laughs) you know (laughs) Uh, because it does it resonates so deeply with with what i'm doing as well yeah are so are you pretty big into psychology do you read a lot of psychology books Um, I don't read a lot of psychology books. I do listen to a crap ton of TED Talks. That's like my jam. I love love to hear different perspectives. Um, I'm somebody who's like very open to ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that when we start closing down that information, that's where we start to kind of lose that battle of of figuring out a solution. Um, So I'm really open to hearing um, different types of psychology and different types Mm -hmm. of treatment methods and stuff like that. I have read a lot of psychology books, obviously, for, <laughs> in for the school, four years like, I've been in school. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was psych. It was the books that really drew me in. It was a, a class called Abnormal Psych. And that's where you start looking at like schizophrenia and bipolar and, and mm-hmm. how these different things not only um, are happening uh, in people's like physical lives, but then there's like mm-hmm. chemical processes and stuff that are going mm-hmm. wrong that are causing these issues. Yeah, man. Dude, I, I wish... I took more psychology. I never took a single psychology class in school aside from organizational behavior because I was a business grad. Mm-hmm. Um, and organizational right. behavior is like psychology within the workplace. It's like how to motivate people, blah, blah, blah. And it is like rooted in psychology. Um, and I love that stuff. But uh, TED Talks and stuff. Do you, do you have a favorite TED Talk? I don't have like a favorite one. Okay, hold um, on, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. I feel like I'm getting hardcore deja vu right now. Have we talked about TED Talks before? I don't know. We might this, have is, this is like, uh, I feel like I've asked you this question. <laughs> uh, for we, we might have. No, I don't have. Uh, there's a podcast that are just psychology TED Talks. Okay. And it'll be different. It will be different people every week. So I definitely like subscribe to that and listen. Yeah. And have you, have you sometimes listened? It's, sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to that? cut you off. But have you listened to uh, Adam Grant? I don't believe I have. He's an organizational psychologist. But uh, he has two TED Talks, I think. And they've both gone quite viral like they they're two of the mm. larger ones and like very rarely does someone ever get two ted talks in their life you know it's like <laughs> to have two original ideas what <laughs> um yeah uh anyways he's he's one of my favorites i like read everything he puts out he's been kind of like the guy i lean on I, i'd like to go into doing organizational psychology at some point uh, in my life go and mm. pursue my master's in science in that in that field that's the hope that'd be really cool that'd be really cool yeah there's definitely like a whole separate kind of section of um, psychology that has to do with like how people behave in these different Mm -hmm. environments and stuff like that. And understanding that can really help, um, like an organization really build morale or build that rapport with their, Mm -hmm. with their subordinates and with their people to make it like that cohesive work environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, I could talk about this for forever. I mean, I've talked about (laughs) it a little bit on the show. Uh, there's a few books that I recommend to people that are psychology based texts, uh, always, um, one, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl is like such an amazing book. Uh, a, uh, have you read it? Did you did you read that in, in your undergrad? I actually did not. Dude, you got to read it. Uh, he develops like this psychological uh, framework called logotherapy. Uh, it's like finding your mm-hmm. logos or, or your why, but it's written from the perspective of a, a 
I think he was like a clinically trained psychiatrist and a Jew living in Nazi Germany who then was taken into an internment camp. And he basically like tries to analyze uh, who- I do you know this guy? Yeah, 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 Victor Frankl. I 100% yeah. read about this man, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, he's dope. As the soon book as you is said amazing. The, psychology, or the, the concentration camps, he observed a lot of the behaviors yep. of the other inmates and then wrote a huge book about it after they were released. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank that God was... that he made it through all of that, you know? Well, we well that was the whole study. Work. Right. That was the whole study he was doing. He's like, okay, so everything in my life has been stripped away from me except psychology. They can't take away what's in here, what I've learned. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, okay, so what can I find meaning in? Well, I can find meaning in performing a study well here and like analyzing mm -hmm. who, who survives and who doesn't. Uh, and he right. challenges all his like preconceived biases. He's like, oh, it's going to be the guys that are strong and, and muscular and all these things. And turns mm -hmm. out it's not. It, it turns right, out it's yeah. the people who have like a deeper sense of meaning in their life that is larger mm -hmm. than oh, I have money or I have this or I had a big house or any of those things. It's like, because all that can be taken away from you. But if mm -hmm. you have a deeper sense of meaning that can't be stripped away from you, no matter what, you will last. You will, you will, yeah. you are a survivor. But that book yeah. and then, no. uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> I was gonna say like, what a amazing achievements of like human spirit. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. uh, that's what I, the kind of context I always take out of these things too is how strong he had to be in order to just maintain this, poised to get this study done during this time where he's just as interned as everybody else you yeah. know um rad lad it's amazing a seriously rad lad highly recommend the book to anyone hard book to read but so important to read uh the other book though that i i read it honestly like it could be condensed and it's kind of like hard to read at first but fascinating book that i think kendama players should read in particular is called flow by mihai csikszentmihalyi have you read that book I definitely have not dude oh, you gotta read that one <laughs> uh he he talks all about like uh the, the flow state he's kind of the guy who like coins the term flow state that state of optimal performance where it you're mm -hmm. hitting something that's the right level of difficulty that like almost makes time pass by slowly uh, where you're just landing kinometric after kinometric after kinometric or whatever it is and getting into that zone that every kinoma player knows so well mm -hmm. uh, that we can tap yeah. into. But he talks about how to activate that state and like how to get into that state and like talking about what that state means and, and why we perform so well in those moments. And then he breaks all that down. And I think it's a really good book or at least like you maybe don't read the book, but like look up some articles online on the flow state. Mm -hmm. uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, there's no way I can spell out his name. It's like some... I think he's like, <laughs> he's like Eastern European or something. Without like butchering that. it. Yeah. <laughs> I have it on my shelf. No, I'll definitely check somewhere. it out. But um, um, anyways, yeah, we can talk psychology. Just new resources like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, we can talk psychology probably all day. I, I literally could. I, I, I could talk about a lot of things for a long time, but we got to get into Konami here a little bit. Uh, yeah, otherwise, yeah, we're going to we lose do. some of the new listeners. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so you were you working at a brewery. You met this guy who uh, was working there Kendama. as well. He was playing yep, Kendama. and he was always playing. Um, and then so it was April of I don't, uh, whenever the pandemic started. What year was that? 2020? <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah April of 2020, I went on like Amazon and I was like looking for companies like just came down this to buy and I kept seeing sweet 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 sweets all over the place so I bought my first sweets um grain split and uh I remember, I remember when I got it out of the box I was like trying to find something to wipe it with because I'm like why is it so sticky like this feels gross I was like I can't uh, feel like gross. this is right you know and I'm like why is it so damn sticky like my shirt was sticking to it I'm like this is terrible but little did I know that's, I wish I had that Tama still, you know? Um, Just that yeah. sticky. <laughs> yeah, so I got that first one and I got a couple cup tricks. I got like big cup, Ken foot big cup. And I was like, it's on, we're learning this thing, you know? Um, and it really took off from there. That's super cool. And how long after that did you start New Laced? Because you, you, okay, so, um, I know that you actually had kind of a former brand before it evolved into what it is now, where you were mm -hmm. making a uh, conditioner or like Kanama wax uh, yeah. beforehand. Cause I was one of, one of your uh, original <laughs> customers. I don't, I think yes, you sir. sent it to me. I don't think I bought it. I don't remember. <laughs> no, I did. I did just try to, I flexed you out some coffee scent. Cause I knew you were into the coffee stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. I had to get and that advertising like, uh, out. <laughs> hey, I gotta, gotta, gotta hit up Adam. Um, yeah, so uh, it did actually work out really well because I was working on that coffee scent and then I was I started really getting into the review 
And I'm like, this would be perfect. I could send this guy some. Um, yeah, so I started with conditioner just because yeah. I have, um, you know what? I'm gonna move this real quick and show you guys. Uh, I have like every craft spec that <laughs> exists except Yo. for two. Um, there was two that were two of two. Um, and I actually tracked one down online, but the price that they wanted for Ken only, I just wasn't willing to pay. Uh, like one of them I have up here, this craft veggie, I call it the veggie cause they didn't give it a name. Um, oh, that's so cool. This was one of four. Wow. And so like in my short time playing Kendama, I tracked it down somehow. What, what uh, <laughs> was the fascination with craft, uh, specs? Well, first it was really that I just loved that there's this like multi-cut color pattern, um, press woods. Like it just really looked so different than a you know, maple Ken, which mm -hmm. is what I had first known. Um, and then once I got my first one, uh, which was the Voyager, this guy, I actually, uh, just this little green and blue. Yeah. Okay. I actually, um, I fell in love with the shape. And then it was my absolute go-to shape for my first year of Kendama. Um, and I just kept, I couldn't get away from it. Like, no matter what I tried, I would just be like, I need a craft again. And I'll go and buy another one, even though they're way more than I wanted to spend. But uh, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's super cool. So then you, well, okay, so how did the conditioner journey start? Uh, where, where did the gap kind of fill in there where you were like, oh, I can do this? Yeah, so I, so I got the, um, the Voyager and then I got the Rebel. Uh, the red and black one. Mm -hmm. And I was like reading online that like, you know, you don't want to play specs without conditioning them because they can crack or chip or break. And so immediately I got like super afraid that these things were just gonna like crumble. <laughs> and so like, I was actually looking for find my find your wings uh, yep. for a while, but everywhere I looked there was sold out online. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, all right, I started like Googling like wood conditioners and like looking for ingredients that go into them and trying to find something that I thought looked similar. And so I messed around with a bunch of different like blends. And then I found one that was like really good. And uh, it wasn't oily. It gave you like a nice tack on the Ken. Um, and you didn't feel like it was rubbing off on the Tamas. It wasn't getting on your hands. Um, yeah. And so it was really just for me. And then I was in, the, I'm in a, a group chat and I like showed these guys that I was making conditioner and they're like, let me try it. So I sent them all a bunch of free samples and they loved it. And that kind of was like, well, maybe I can like use this as like a step into Kendama too. Mm. Um, and then from there, uh, I was just like getting more invested in, into Kendama. Mm -hmm. And um, truthfully, and without throwing any shade, I thought the art was really boring. <laughs> and coming from kind of like a little bit of an art background with the brewery and stuff like that, I wanted to like put my own brand out there, put my own name out there, like at least my own image. Um, and that's where Tamaguchi came from. Yeah, your, your first uh, Tama design. Yeah. Yeah, so my first Tama design, I actually did these guys without the black tracker. They forgot it. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, so it didn't, the first batch of 50 didn't come with the tracker, and this top tracker was smaller. Uh, so I did adjust it after the first batch. So I got the first 50, and I sent some out. Um, I think 40, 40, like maybe 44 of them to tops went out to like actual customers and people liked them a lot. Um, and they were like, is there going to be more? Yeah. Yeah. Just wait. Uh, you sold 44 of them on your first batch after not like having a brand face or anything. You don't even have mm -hmm. a Ken. They're just a Tama. Uh, but yeah. I remember watching this happening. Right. So you had started this like conditioner company and I'm like, Oh, this guy's cool. Mm -hmm. He sent me on some stuff. I think you sent me this and I feel like you sent me other things with it. I don't remember what all, or did you just send me that? Right, it doesn't matter. I feel like you probably sent me a note or something, a nice <laughs> I love you card or I, who knows, yes. <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> um, uh, but, but you you took kind of a different approach to your marketing uh, for your brand where you actually kind of back -wrote it a lot of other brands by going into the group chat or not the group chat, but the Facebook pages. You were really active mm -hmm. in the Dama fam, uh, Instagram, correct? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I utilize, um, I see Instagram as like my biggest tool. Um, I get, that's where I get definitely the most interaction, the most engagement. Mm -hmm. I was really active, um, in the Facebook group, um, coming from the beer world. One of the big things that we have is these giant, uh, beer trading groups. They're like these little inner circles of illegal activity. It's kind of illegal, but it's, it's everybody's adults, right? <laughs> it's just not legal to ship alcohol. 
So coming from that kind of arena, I knew that there was probably groups out there for all like these niche markets, these niche kind of um, hobbies and stuff. Like there was probably a group out there for, for Kendama. So I started to like, you know, in Facebook Kendama. Mm -hmm. I actually joined a bunch of them before I ever got on Damafam or FKC. And a lot of them were just really dead for like years. Um, <laughs> And then I got into FKC and I was like, finally, like I can talk to somebody about Kandama, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh man. Uh, yeah, yeah. Keep, keep yeah. going. So I want to know like how so you, you, how you, how you, how you kind of grew in that space. Cause you became a name in Dama fam. You were more than just like a guy in there from, from my experience. Yeah. I, I mean, I hope so. Uh, I try to just be like positive. You know, I use a lot of the, my psych background and a lot of my social work background and just helping skills and learning how to listen to people and talk and, um, that was, I think something that was big. I was also, I'm also very keen about not adding to negativity. Um, even if I'm my own bias, it's like, yeah, I don't like this person. I also try to walk it back and think from like different perspectives and kind of play devil's advocate in some, some levels. Um, and then, uh, I was, Dama fam definitely accepted me a lot. Um, which, you know, I, I can't thank them for enough because, you know, I was starting to realize uh, FKC had some very toxic qualities um, where there wasn't a lot of regulation of what was being said, which is fine. Like I'm all for free speech, but it definitely got to the point where it just was a lot of like badgering and berating people. And I didn't want to be involved in that. Um, so I definitely kept pushing myself towards Dama fam where I saw like a community that was a lot more tight knit and willing to kind of um, listen to each other, which was big for me. Yeah, totally. That's super cool. And you kind of kickstarted a lot of your brand's momentum in that space on Facebook mm -hmm. um, before you really kickstarted a lot of it on Instagram. Because I would see, I like, I'm kind of like a back backseat watcher in the Kanama community <laughs> sometimes where I kind of like, I'm in all of the groups, I'm on all the discords, I kind of read everybody's stuff and, and see it all. Mm -hmm. Whether or not I'm like liking or replying or commenting, I don't know. I'm, I get lazy there. But <laughs> but I remember seeing people just like, oh, new lace kendama, new lace kendama, Tamaguchi, Tamagu like every mm -hmm. other post when when you came out. And it's like, how does this guy do this? Right. How are you connecting so deeply with all these people? And I think what's really interesting is you took such a weird route to starting a kendama company, right? You started <laughs> as making conditioner, then you mm -hmm. launched a Tama, a, not even a Ken Tama. You launched yep. just a Tama <laughs> and then eventually you launched a can and you've like, it's almost like you've yeah. been creating a module, a uh, Kendama brand where you're just creating all these individual pieces. Like what's next? A Serato, yeah. then a, then a can. And then put them together. <laughs> yeah. Just like um, assembling it, a brand piece by piece. It was, it's kind of funny too, because you can almost look at that timeline and that journey and see how much more invested I've become in Kendama. Mm -hmm. um, it went from just a little bit to, then I, Wax wasn't like a thing that I was like, I'm going to be rich or make a brand or something like that. I just wanted to be involved and add some, you know, add something to the community. Mm -hmm. And then you can see as I get the Tama, like I get a little bit more invested mm -hmm. and I start realizing like, okay, maybe there is a space for me here. Like I felt really like I had a warm welcome and I was well received. Mm -hmm. um, and so from there, I decided to get a couple people on the team to help me kind of spread uh, the Tamas. Mm -hmm. And quickly I was like I don't want these guys playing other people's Kens <laughs> yeah you're like ah I gotta make my own that's super yeah, interesting and so was that a weird invite to invite players to join your team when all you had was a Tama because I remember yeah. when you started okay, <laughs> so when you started your team they didn't even have Tamas yet like some of them they didn't oh even gosh. have your Tama you yeah. just like hey you want to join the new lace squad We'll ship yeah, you out something was... and they're already posting on your behalf <laughs> and they're not even playing your stuff. It's just like, it's more like they're repping a brand yeah. kind of like anonymously. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I, the first four people, so Gage, uh, Luke, Kelsey, and um, Cassie really were ride or die for me. And I can't thank them enough. Um, <laughs> you know, they definitely put on even before they had product, like <laughs> the first, like, I think I got was like able to send them each like one Tama and like, and like some of them it was way later than they had already been on the team. Um, and it, yeah, it was crazy asking them. The first person I asked was Gage. Um, I was looking for someone strong that I thought could be a team captain, someone that I, I aligned a lot with their values and kind of their, their, uh, the energy they were putting out there and Gage hit that nail on the head. And obviously he's this incredible player so i thought like there's nothing better than starting with a solid rock 
Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was weird because I have to, I had to, and I still kind of have to um, put it in terms of like, I'm a small company and I'm trying to build this brand bigger. And your spot is, your, your part of this is helping me build this brand bigger by getting in a little bit more exposure. And my, my part of this is like supplying you with things that you can use. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's tough because it does kind of sound, it sounds like not a fully put together company. And so I could see why some people might have been like, oh, like it'll fail, or maybe I shouldn't like invest into this. But the uh, the first four really did, and they invested in hard. Um, and I think with their momentum, like they really kept me motivated to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and figuring out what's next. Um, you know, like making a Ken shape. I have no clue what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, like I literally was like looking at all of these different Kens I have and I'm like, how do they even come up with this crap? You know, <laughs> like, I wouldn't know. I, I have no hot clue how to measure a thing. I like, what do, what do you send to the factory and be like, hey, to a hand oh, drawing, can you make something kind of like this? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. So I actually asked Hanru, uh, I'm like, Hanru is the big manufacturer yeah. and I asked them, what could I do? And so they were like, oh, you got to send us this kind of file. And so like, a couple of days goes by and I'm trying to research what kind of file this is even. It was like OTEP and these names I've never heard of. Um, they definitely weren't illustrated file types. I can tell you that. <laughs> you <know? laughs> um, and uh, so finally I got them to send me like a model one Kendama, like blueprint. And it was one of the old school, like small, like everything was a small cup and like had no ridges. And they're like, you can adjust this. And so I sent them back the same picture, but with different numbers. <laughs> so I had no clue what it was even going to look like until they gave me like a blueprint back. Um, I, uh, I worked with them and got uh, their engineer to help me out <laughs> uh, getting yeah. all that stuff put together. But yeah, I mean, um, even then, even with this blueprint in hand, I was still like, there's a 90% chance I'm going to hate it. Right. I've already been a picky player. I basically mm -hmm. only played crafts and uh, the 2020 squad. Um, mm -hmm. If it wasn't for those two cans, I would have been really sad. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought I'm going to end up getting this can and I'm going to hate it and I'm going to get stuck playing it. Um, and mm -hmm. to my surprise, I didn't get something I hated. I got something that was like my ideal can shape and I don't know how I lucked out, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and that was the Ranger shape, correct? Yep. That's uh, the Ranger shape. This this guy yeah, right here. I, I was looking for mine this morning. I actually swapped it out. I have the Tama here and I think the Ranger shape is on another Ken right now with a different Tama that I brought out to Van Gem, but I have the, I have the Tama right here. Um, I don't mm -hmm. even remember the Mayflower, correct? The Mayflower. Yep. I got my names right. <laughs> <Kill it. laughs> but my, my Ranger shape is somewhere. I was trying to find it this morning so I could pull it up, but you no, know, seriously, if, if that was your first design, the, what I got, it, it's incredible. Like genuinely very shocked. And that's me coming from like someone who's been playing Kendama for six and a half years, someone who's been involved in the scene. It's like for a first design, you kind of don't expect much from a company. You're like, ah, I'll yeah. buy it to support <laughs> them so that they can make a better second design. But seriously, like a fire shape out the bat, it was really surprising to me. Yeah. Um, and that's also something I think that's a little bit of my hump right now, right? Is there's a lot of older players who assume that because I'm in and it's a new shape, that it's not chalked up to today's standards or to all of the bigger brands that they know so well. Um, and I know that these other brands did their, their thing to get their products there too. I did look it out just by nailing it on the, on the head the first time, but it is just as um, worthy of their time and attention. And so the, the hump is getting it in their hands the first time. So then it's not uh, assumptions or question marks. They have something tangible they can try and touch. And so far, whenever I do that, I do get good reception back um, mm -hmm. from a lot of these uh, these older players that have been around the scene for a long time. Totally. Well, do you think that the way that you built your company kind of set you up for that hump because you started small and you, you really built your team around these indie up and coming players that are mm -hmm. kind of like they're getting better known now, but they were pretty lesser known when they first started. Like all of these accounts are like less than a thousand followers or in that just over a thousand follower right. mark. Like they're kind of these new gen up and coming players in the Kanama scene that maybe have their followings on Facebook. Like I know a lot of them are active in the Facebook mm -hmm. Kanama community, like Luke Sedgwick, uh, Wonk Life. Yep. That's where I met him originally was mm -hmm. in some Facebook Ken tournament or something like that. And other than that, like I really didn't know many of the people that you brought on your team at first. And so yeah. you kind of, 
positioned yourself to have that bias because you didn't bring on a, a pre-existing older <laughs> player that's been in the scene for a while. So everybody just assumed it was this newer, smaller company that's just trying to figure itself out. Yeah, um, I guess maybe. Um, I know Gage has been around. He, he was there for a while and then he left mm -hmm. the scene for a while and came back. Um, but I think uh, part of what I really thought and what I saw, like a lot of my ambition with the brand is even with just COVID and everything else, there's an entire new wave of Kendama players. And I feel sure. like personally, I didn't, I didn't feel like I was really uh, identifying with a lot of the brands. Mm -hmm. um, being a newer player in the scene, you do kind of feel like there, not that there's a gatekeeping, but there's, there's a lot of clicks. And I didn't oh, totally. feel like I was able to get involved with those clicks. Like I was always kind of pushed out. And I felt like there's a lot of players that I was noticing like that too. You know, we hear, the rhetoric a lot in FAC and stuff like that. I was like, why won't this guy get sponsored? Um, so I felt like there was a lot of players that were too being overlooked. Um, and so I wanted to kind of give a home to a lot of these newer players that are coming in and are very serious Kendama players um, and maybe weren't coming in from uh, some of these different avenues that we've seen, like the EDM scene, um, you know, with Sweets being very active in that side. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't, feel like I identified with that. So I was looking for a home for myself too. Um, and then in turn providing a home for these other like newer players. But I can definitely see how doing that and being a brand focused on on the newer kind of group of Kendama players does in some in some ways like exclude you uh, from this overall community that's got such a long timeline right now of you know the, the guys who first started you know 10 or 15 years ago is in the States and now are getting their decade mods and stuff like that. Sure. Um, there's definitely a gap, I think, somewhere in there. Yeah, but, but I think you're doing it right, right? You found a place to call home for your audience and for your followers. And I think ultimately, like one of the things that I think you need as a, as a brand, mm -hmm. or that would be such an advantage is actually being at a live event, like at a NACO mm -hmm. with your booth, letting people touch your Kendama because yeah. that's like the bias that so many people have. And that's what gave uh, Lotus Kendama and Quill Kendama such a head start. Uh, like a year or two years ago at NACO because they showed up there with their yep. booth and people were touching their Kens, playing them. And they're like, whoa, these are actually pretty good. Uh, and they're yeah. not just this random brand I see on Instagram. I can actually mm -hmm. trial their Kendama, right? But you haven't had much of that opportunity yet. And so all mm -hmm. you ever can go off of right now is just what people post as clips on Instagram. And, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, well, the player is just really good. It's not the Ken or any of those things. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you haven't had that opportunity yet, which has forced you to be kind of this indie smaller brand right now. Yeah. But I think you're just kind of like on that brink of like getting a bit more mm -hmm. mass adoption from, from the space. Like seriously, man, the, the shape's really fire. Uh, preview listeners, I'm no cap. It's good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, that's something else too. Like I myself am still a newer player. You know what I mean? Like I've got a little bit over a year under my belt now, but that's in terms of Kendama players, like that's still a new player. Um, yeah. But the new players so, like, now they're crazy compared to like, Oh my gosh. Like, you some can of these be playing like, a year today and be as good as someone who's <laughs> been playing for four years, starting four years ago. It's nuts. Yeah. Right. I mean like my uh, you know, like one of my tricks in my one year at it was like, two tap jug to bird or something and like damn like one year and then i look at casey's one year i'm like i'm not even close to this <laughs> you know uh the one that i just posted recently casey henson yeah. um he's insane uh he's doing like border balance like quad ken flips and coming back to i'm like i don't even know how you're doing this dude <laughs> like he's just so honed um yeah. kids be nutty but yeah there's <laughs> yeah i mean and then you even look at uh like you you yui um yep. The younger girl that plays with the Crom squad, I mean, she's amazing. I always say, pound for pound, the most honed Kendama player I've ever seen. <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? She's awesome. Uh, she's, she's incredible to watch. And you think, like, well, in five years, what's that going to look like? Yeah. You know? Absolutely. No, but seriously, man, I think you're in a cool spot right now with New Laced where you have this smaller indie following, but they're really loyal. Like you have mm -hmm. like in marketing, what we call a cult following, this group of people that just like genuinely like rally behind you. And they're like the mm -hmm. New Laced family. And it's yeah. really tight because it's hard for another brand to pull someone out of that because you've created this really ingrained deep culture amongst your followers. And, and I think that's so important. And I think what's interesting is you've done that by using your face, like the New Laced Page is sort of kind of your personal page at the same time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. So New Laced was my personal Kendama page that I made during you know like when I first started, uh, just to post my own progress. And then eventually, the, you know, it got into the wax 
uh, which eventually went into Thomas and Ken's. And there was a point where I like said out loud, I was like, this is no longer my page. <laughs> like, uh, and I stopped posting my personal videos to like the main page. And if you've ever noticed, like I post them to stories, like my level ups and stuff, I'll post it to the story. It's funny. Um, and and so, uh, sorry, but what I was trying to get at with being a new player is I go to these jams. Like I've been to three now. I've been to, um, I went to one in, in New York with the Ken YC guys. Um, we went to the, the New England Kandama Classic um, and we went to one down in Jersey, um, Summer Jam. Um, and those were my first times being at a Kandama event of any kind, you know? So like I show up as a new player and a new brand and I don't know pretty much anybody except for the like handful of guys like uh, MJR and stuff that I've played with before. So it's definitely a, a weird and daunting kind of thing at first, but I just accept it and, and hope that through these interactions, these conversations, I think that's my strong suit even online is I build a lot of rapport with people by having mm -hmm. honest uh, conversations with them. Yeah, I, that's the thing that stood out to me about you originally, like when when we first met, and this is before you ever had New Lace, before you even really had your conditioner, I think we were already talking. It's like you were really an intentional person in this space. And you can tell the difference between someone who's just trying to get something out of you and someone who's trying right. to like just actually engage in the space and become an influence or be a good positive influence to the space. And that was you, right? right. You were you were all about adding value, finding the ways that you <clears throat> participate. Like you really wanted to be a part of Kendama somehow. And you were yeah. looking for that way. And you wanted to bring your own flavor your own creativity and and i think that those people uh you like that category of people have such a home in this space because there is so much opportunity for creatives like yourself to make a home but you were really mm -hmm. forward and intentional about doing that and now you're passing off that torch to your players to go and do that and you're saying like hey now we together get to do this and and i think it's man it's just beautiful it's cool yeah I try to think of too, like my players and everybody that I bring into my fold is like, um, one of the things that I learned from the army when I was in Germany was, uh, they used to like hammer this into our heads. Like you're an ambassador for the United States. Um, being a soldier in, in Europe, uh, you go out and have interactions with the population and that's how that's going to shape a lot of their view towards us. Mm -hmm. If you're this drunk guy out there fighting people, like they're going to think that's what Americans do. Um, so I really kind of like took that idea very personally. And I think of it when I think of my team is, my players are an ambassador for my brand and I need to be able to be sure that they're going to be acting the way that I would act mm -hmm. in these different situations. And I think that's something um, that I built really well within my, my team is mm -hmm. people that I really trust to, to represent the brand and the image and uh, what we want to do with Kendama really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Absolutely. I agree. Okay. Um, let's take a couple minute break. Uh, we got some questions from some listeners of the review that want to know some stuff about you. And then we have a really interesting conversation to jump into after this break uh, regarding one of the questions that's in here and kind of the future of New Lace yeah. and where you're going with the brand. And and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep it rocking. But I think people really want to know the answer to one of these questions in here. <laughs> I'm excited to talk about it. Okay. All right. Uh, we got a question here from uh, Lindsay one two three or Lindzeb one two three this is Lindsay from the Kanama community you know her from the streams. Love Lindsay. she's oh, yeah. always around uh she says will you sponsor more girls and how would I start a jam with no other players near me so I think it's I think it's both a question and like looking for advice um from yourself have you have you ran your own jams yet I have not um that is actually something I wanted to do before the end of the summer um Right now, I'm still between like my bachelor's and my master's, so I have nothing to do, <laughs> which is get, great. Get it uh, and yeah, and I want to try to get someone out here. We just had the NAKC, so I did want to wait for some of these other ones um, to play themselves out. Um, do I plan to sponsor more females? Yeah, I'm not opposed. Um, I don't look at uh, my players as I need girls and guys. I just need good people. You know what I mean? Like that's, ambassadors. that's the standard. I want good people who are going to represent themselves and me well. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I do plan to open up some more sponsorships. I had the, uh, I ran a sponsor me contest and, uh, so far of the four that I added, only one of them is still with us. Um, some of them are personal reasons, um, because I think sometimes players also don't understand that being part of a team and being part of a brand does mean that there is a, like a little area where it becomes sort of work and, um, where you're going to have to dedicate time and commit to this thing. And if you don't, then eventually, you know, that, that relationship kind of has to end. And um, some yeah. people are able to see it beforehand and some people need uh, to be asked, 
you know. Yeah. And, and I but, think that's so a misconception definitely... in general, like amongst Kendama players, that we think that like getting a sponsorship is like, oh, chill. I have this thing now that I can put in my bio and like, and it's great and they'll pay me money and I don't really mm -hmm. have to do anything aside from like <laughs> playing ball in a cup. But like, it is more than that. You have to wear the face of that brand, be a good representation of that. Like you are an extension of that brand's face now. Mm -hmm. That brand is putting trust in you and they're kind of relying on you because it's their primary mode of marketing, especially in Kendama. Right. Uh, we don't, yeah. like, very few brands are doing other marketing than influencer based marketing through players and sponsorships. Yeah. And uh, I'm sorry, I just brain farted. <laughs> Dude, that's okay. That's um, okay. And the, <laughs> the other thing, I guess, too, is like um, one of the misconceptions I think that a lot of people see is they'll see this amazing player and be like, no one will sponsor him or her. Um, I think that we have to also step back and think like, do they want to be sponsored? Are they looking for a specific team? And uh, do they have the time and energy to actually dedicate to a sponsorship? And not only that, I'd add on top of that, are they even the right person to be sponsored? They may be great at playing Kendama, but that doesn't mean mm -hmm. that they're a great advocate for a brand. That doesn't mean that they'll right. actually bring a positive uh, return on that investment for that brand. Uh, there there's so many factors that people don't think about and they're like oh he can do this trick so he should be sponsored it's like what that's dumb yeah 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 you guys no. are so <laughs> so you, silly <laughs> yeah you definitely and, and again that goes back to ambassadorship you know what i mean um i would be there's a lot of players that i think are amazing players but a lot of players who i also think that image doesn't fit my brand and i wouldn't offer them the spot because of that and it's not because I dislike them. It's because I'm looking for something specific. Mm -hmm. um, and as and a really brand quick, owner, you need to know that. You need to know what yeah. your your people are. You have to develop that culture from the start. Otherwise, you will mm -hmm. lose it. Uh, and the second question, how to start jams in your area? I would say the best bet is to kind of look on FKC or Dama Fam and find people within your area and try to organize some sort of group chat where you can... Mm -hmm. um, talk to a lot of these people and figure out like, when do you all have availabilities and stuff like that? And if they're willing to come out and do these things. So some people do like are a little bit more introverted and have a harder time being social, even with mm -hmm. a hobby that they enjoy. Yeah. Uh, on top of that though, too, you can also find people geographically via Instagram. Uh, th that's how I found all of the Calgary community generally. And the Edmonton community is I would like look up Kendama Canada and then I'd like try and drill down and find people and I'd like go onto their profiles and see if they did a geotag on one of their posts. And I'd be like, oh, that person's jamming in Red Deer. That's only an hour away from me. I'm going to hit him up and see if he wants to come to a jam. I, I grinded for our first like five or six jams to like get yeah. people out. I was like, yo, <laughs> homie, we're jamming in two weeks. I was very invitational, very personal. I would send them a, a personal DM. And then we had a group chat as well. And I was like, guys, come on out, come on out, come on out. And now we get like, I don't know, depends on the day, anywhere between 10 to 20 people up for a jam. And it's dope. Love it. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, there's nothing better than meeting people in person and, and stuff. I think that's the best way that I learned to like just getting others mm -hmm. perspectives on how they're approaching these tricks and lines and their style of kendama really helps me shape and mold my own. Mm -hmm. um, question here from Widowmaker Matt underscore. He wants hey, to know, Widowmaker Matt. He wants to know who had the first kendama that you saw. Widowmaker Matt had the first kendama that I saw. He was the one doing crazy dirty finger lines in his story. And I'm like, also, he's like pretty blind in one eye. So it makes it even that much more impressive that he's doing all of this. Yeah, and dude. he's he's such a nice, like amazing guy but also such an amazing player too. Yeah, he's he's the homie. He sends me video messages and, and voice <laughs> calls all the time. We chat, he's such a gem. He keeps telling me he's going to send me beer, but uh, <laughs> man, yeah. he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 seriously. He's one of the people that I'd really like to go down and meet when I, when I finally make my way down to the States after the borders open and do a little tour around. Uh, he's such a gem, guys. Go follow Widowmaker Matt underscore on Instagram. He's a, a, a human worth getting to know. Absolutely. 100%. I agree with that. Um, we got a question from the dark arts with the A's as spelt as four. Guys, just Force. pick yeah. your Instagram names. Um, <laughs> do you have any strange rituals you do before bed every night? Do I have any? Oh, I do. So I am the most avid ice cream man in the world. No, uh, I was actually sending. Yeah, I have. A, we're in a group chat. And right now, Friendlies has this ice cream called S'mores. It's a collab with the Boy Scouts. They only release a certain amount every year, like a per cases. And so it's very limited. 
Uh, I have six of them in my freezer right now. <laughs> I don't want to like miss out. What if they're gone? And then I go back, it's my favorite ice cream and now I'm screwed. But yeah, every single night before I go to sleep, I always have a big bowl of ice cream, like giant. <laughs> oh, I would die. I'm lactose intolerant and I would not sleep. Oh no. <laughs> It'd be the worst. I like, I do ice cream maybe once a month or like once every other month and I go through a little spurt and it's usually when I'm already not mm -hmm. feeling good and I just want to like sulk in my misery. Then I have a bowl of ice cream <laughs> because I just want to like distract myself. You're like, I deserve this pain. <laughs> I deserve this pain. I'm really masochistic. <laughs> Uh, my okay, son um, is actually lactose uh, free as well so we have special ice cream for him in case you ever come over i got your back oh bless you <laughs> special um, cheese too if you like that <laughs> you know what cheese cheese doesn't seem to bother me as much as as ice cream ice cream is like the killer for me mm. i can like it's real thick it's heavy yeah i can even have like a glass of milk and be kind of okay but like a bowl mm -hmm. of ice cream i'm hooped we got a question <laughs> here from yofi boy he wants to know what were the struggles of gaining a community to follow you um, well, I mean, if you uh, listen back to the podcast, it was my personal Instagram. Report. So part of it was just building the same report that everybody who is trying to put out tricks and stuff is, is finding people who are like minded and, and are willing to kind of engage with you. Um, you're going to get a lot of people you don't know or might not even ever engage with you. Um, so yeah, I think the biggest struggle is really finding those like minded people and for me personally, with the brand, it was really finding people who were willing to give me a chance um, and to see past the fact that I was a newer player or a newer um, brand and just uh, give me that first chance. And like, I was always willing, like, if you don't like it, be honest with me, um, because that really helps me figure out what's next. Uh, so yeah, definitely, definitely those things. Mm -hmm. Amen. And, uh, and you sent out some, some conditioner to me. So I, I hope, I hope my sure. advocacy helped. <laughs> I think the review is what got me the 2k. So. <laughs> oh, actually, no, no, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I wish, I wish I had that much influence to be able to do that for my friends. But you never know. You never know. You never know. You really don't. Um, Yofi Boy also wants to ask, do you love me? I do really love that kid. Uh, he is an amazing um, younger guy. Um, I love chatting with him because he's got a very uh, different perspective sometimes. Um, and I really like that. And uh, we seem to have a really good relationship and he's absolutely in love with the Ranger or at least with New Lace, maybe not the Ranger. He has told me a couple of times he wishes it was chunkier. So uh, we'll see what happens. We have Sapper coming up in August. So you never know. I see, I see. Uh, we got a question here from Nick Deepstama. Um, this has already been answered, but just to clarify one more time, favorite ice cream, the s'mores ice cream for you. S'mores uh, for friendlies. For me? Only the friendlies. Only the friendlies. Okay. For me, yeah, there's a ice cream company based in Calgary called Righteous, and they have a bourbon vanilla bean ice cream that's really good. And if you get some fresh uh, raspberries and mix that in and like swirl it around, it's a Ooh. gelato. It's super good. Mm. Uh, and am I an ice cream fan? I am, but ice cream is not a fan of me. So it's kind of a twofold <laughs> question or twofold answer. Uh, Von Bradlums wants to know, Jacob, what is the first trick you do when you pick up a Dama? Uh, I am a big uh, one-up Insta Lighthouse jug spiker. I don't know why that is just such like an easy little, everything just flows together, right? And if I can hit that within like a couple of tries, I'm like, it's going to be a good day. <laughs> like two three tries in i lace it real quick i'm like oh yeah oh yeah we're gonna film today yeah. you know yeah yeah i think my go-to is always like airplane 1.5 juggle spike i think like Ooh, that that's is a good the trick too. that i should hit like the gen generally like on a good day like eight out of ten or nine out of ten times it's like a trick i'm mm -hmm. pretty honed on and if i miss that a couple times i'm like oh no we're not filming today yeah <laughs> yeah sometimes i'll those insta lighthouses will come out hot just flipping so quick and i'm like why am i not like slowing it down i just already know i'm like today is not the day but that's the days that i go back to my old uh love of stalls <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely uh cookie underscore kandama uh wants me to ask you why you why are you so cute what what's your what's your uh, i do it routine? for you cookie i do it for you cookie <laughs> uh what's yeah, your, yeah I give, give like... us i don't know okay hold on let me just let me just say something uh the Brewview community has got this weird, fan, like, I don't know, I don't know what to call it, but like, they always want to know what like hair care routines people have or beard routines. <laughs> I'm, I'm in for it. Like if that's what the people want. So uh, 
you want to drop your beard deeds because you got a good one <laughs> thank you when i got out of the military i was actually unsure if i could grow a beard because i've been shaving my whole life <laughs> and so i was really happy to see it come in um but yeah i mean honestly i just use uh i do have like a special beard wash um and it smells you know when you go to the barbershop that like powder they have it's like a very specific smell it smells like that so i love it um and then other than that just make sure you moisturize and brush it if you're not brushing your beard then it's not going to come in the way you want it to yeah. that's something my barber taught me <laughs> do you have any tips for me i never can fill in right here it always ends up as a gap i get these mutton chops down here oh dude this little gap, <laughs> and it's like this ragged mustache I've been, I've been... i think that you should just send it get the chops in then hit a mullet too like the whole thing that'd be one really good look <laughs> i don't know about that i don't know about that i might yeah. lose some followers I have a buddy who has the same issue. He has big spots right here. He can't ever connect to his chin and his cheeks. So I just make fun of him. I don't know. <laughs> hey, don't make fun of me when I try. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> We're working on it. I, I have noticed it's been getting better. Like it slowly is getting closer. I think by next No Shave November, I will finally be able to have a connecting beard. That's my hope. I'm 25, man. I'm going to be 26 yeah. in November. I, I, I want, I've wanted a, a full beard for a long time. And it's yep. just been evading me for most of my life. It's been a long journey. So yeah. send, send some uh, thoughts and prayers my way. It is true too. The longer you start to grow it um, and, and let it grow in and then cut it and stuff like trim, like definitely gets bigger and bushier. Um, I think it's a lot of those smaller hairs that don't grow as fast. Finally, like have time to catch up with everything else. Mm -hmm. So then you get the full look. Um, because mm -hmm. when I first started growing it, it was a lot more spotty than it seems now. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, um, there are a couple questions in here that all relate to the same thing, and we've been holding off mm -hmm. talking about this for a little bit, uh, and the announcement I'm assuming will be live before this episode goes live, uh, regardless, so um, we'll, we'll, this is kind of like the pre-announcement <laughs> conversation that will come out after the conversation, but the prequel. Um, if people have been paying attention in the Konama scene as of today, which is the 17th of July, uh, there's an announcement made by one of the smaller brands in the Kanama community, Artemis, uh, that they are uh, closing shop. Uh, Zay has relinquished his ownership and has sold his brand. And everybody is wondering who bought Artemis? Who bought this brand that has been, you know, the, the center of a lot of conversation, both, you know, sometimes positive, sometimes not so positive, and has really just had a lot of heat around it throughout its time. And you know, we could talk a little bit about why that is, but we've also had Zay on here and we've also had Matthew from the team on here. So we've heard some of those conversations, but mm -hmm. uh, the real question people want to know, and uh, you already gave the point, uh, who bought Artemis Kendamas? Yeah. So a uh, new laced Kendama bought out Artemis, um, was it Monday, last Monday, this past Monday? Um, yeah. So uh, Zay approached me and uh, asked if that would be something I was in interested in. And I took the night and thought it over. Um, and I thought, you know, with, uh, with this, I could grab uh, another Ken shape, right? Um, the V2 is a very big modern Ken shape, which is polar opposite of the kind of Kens that I like. If you look at the Ranger, like I would say it's kind of modern, but I, I love that old school feeling. Like I said, I, I fell in love with the craft. Um, so I try to always bring those roots into my Dhamma. Um, but that being said, um, uh, I understand that my personal preference is in everybody's, like I said, Yofi boy wants, um, some, uh, chunkier Kens. Some people love the big cups. Um, I think that's also something that Lotus has done really well is kind of marketing themselves with this, you know, very modern shape. And I think people are starting to gravitate towards it, especially some of the younger players. So for me, it was a very good move to have something that I could eventually bring it to my fold um, and, and have ready for when I want to release that. Uh, and the second thing was definitely, they have an in-house paint, uh, mm -hmm. which is the uh, only thing anybody talks about now. <laughs> yeah. um, Everybody's getting you know. <laughs> tired of sticky and silk and yeah. they want so in-house paints. And that's the differentiator now these days. It's like, what paint yeah. do you play? Right. Um, you know, I have a great pen shape and I would, argue that some of the better art in the community, at least that's my personal bias, obviously. Um, but definitely I wanted to look at something for the future, right? New Lace needs to continue to grow. Um, and I can't stay stagnant and think that just what I'm doing now is gonna always be perfect. So I have to look at what's gonna be next. And if adopting in an in-house paint eventually is something we can do, that's, I'm all for that. 
hopefully we can tweak it and look for different ways. Like, um, I know it's a sticky, so maybe look for a way that we can mat it out so it feels more like a cush or a friction clear or something, uh, excuse me, that, uh, that we can utilize in the future. Um, I think that's definitely, like you're saying, the, the way if, if you don't have anything in-house, you're kind of uh, slacking right now. <laughs> That's what everybody's doing right now, right? Because we just got cushion. Um, I don't know if Kusa really has an in-house paint right now, but like Analog is working on some stuff. A lot of the smaller brands are working on their stuff. Obviously, Friction Clear is like the the biggest hype beast, you know, thing mm -hmm. of the generation of Kanama right now. It's like Soul was able to sell uh, Ken and Thomas with Friction Clear for over a hundred dollars USD and sold out in less than like what two minutes or three minutes. Oh yeah, it's like, it was quick. I had an alarm. I couldn't even get to it fast enough. I didn't even, try. <laughs> I knew, yeah. I knew it wasn't even going to be possible on my Canadian Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I haven't tried a Sioux lab yet. And I was like, this will be my opportunity. Uh, that didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, so. The hype is real. Like seriously, friction clear is mm -hmm. dope. It's really cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that's, that's all I'll say for now. I, I, this is about <laughs> you. Yes. Um, so, okay, Jacob, talk me through that decision. Obviously, that wasn't like a simple decision. Obviously, there's a lot of weight that comes with that decision, specifically on the brand side of things. And is that something that you mm -hmm. are worried about? Obviously, we're talking kind of present pre pretense. We don't really know what's going to happen yet uh, because yeah. it hasn't been public. Obviously, there's a lot of speculation and a lot of people assume that it's it's you. Um, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, talk, talk me through some of the decision making. So, yeah, I mean... I was never looking at it as in terms of like um, a negative. I didn't see really a negative that could come out of it, right? Um, one of the things people have been asking me in DMs a lot is like, uh, am I gonna run Artemis? And the answer is absolutely not. Like 0% of me wants to run that company. I think that it has built up enough bad blood on its own um, and enough too much controversy that I don't want to take on a task that big of trying to reframe this image that doesn't work for me. Um, personally, I think New Ace has a better brand image. So I'd rather just adopt the things that were going right with it um, into my fold at some point, rather than try to revamp or, or um, resurrect this brand that's having you know, issues within the community. Um, so it definitely wasn't easy. And I, I truly don't think um, anybody's gonna, I mean, I would hope that nobody sees it in some negative terms. Um, I figured personally that because New Lace was already established, we have, like I said, we have our second Ken shape coming out in August, um, that there wasn't a lot of overlap where it was like, it's not a merger, um, it was a complete buyout. Um, and my point with it, yeah, it was an act, I took it over. Um, but my thing was, I, I'm just gonna let Artemis, the brand itself die. Um, but that doesn't mean that's something that the community does love, like uh, the V2 shape or a, an in-house paint that could be utilized should just go to waste. Um, and that was really my thought process behind it was mm -hmm. I wasn't willing to let something just die that I saw there was a value in. Um, maybe it wasn't the right pitch or the right way it was um, shown. It, you know, there was, like I said, brand image goes a long way. Um, so hopefully under the new lace crown, uh, we'll be able to re, uh, re-envision that and take it with us forward. Hmm. That's super cool. Uh, are you worried at all that um, the the followership or the consumer base of Artemis that then now flocks over to New Lace for your shape begins to, to shape and change uh, who New Lace is? Because I know that oftentimes like, okay, you're, let's say you're a brand outside of Kanama uh, and you acquire mm -hmm. another brand that has its loyal following that carries its own ethos of customers, right? It's a different demographic of customers, but now they come and they start integrating mm -hmm. with your customer base that has already been given a narrative of how they participate with new lace Kanama. Do you think there might be a clash there at all? Or do you think you'll be able to totally sidestep that? I'm hoping uh, that I'll be able to sidestep it. One thing that I know is that we're both younger companies. So we did have a decent amount of crossover in terms of like newer players who liked both brands. Um, so I, I hope that'll help. Um, and, uh, and as far as like my personal approach with Kandama isn't going to change. Um, a lot of the guys that were diehard Artemis fans that have reached out to me, um, I've been very clear, like, I don't intend to be Artemis ever. Uh, I don't intend to make New Lace even remotely that brand. Um, I have my own personal style and, and approach, and I'm going to continue to be true to that because that's what's gotten me here. Mm -hmm. um, but in the same breath, uh, you know, one of the things that they loved about Artemis was his shape. Um, and if that's something you're looking for, then that's something I can eventually in the, 
in the future provide a version of that shape that you'll be able to play and be in love with just as you were before. Um, yeah, I'm, I didn't want to deal with any of the like dramatic side of, of acquiring it. Yeah, that's totally fair. Um, what about the players on Artemis? Artemis had a pretty wide range of, of mm -hmm. talent on their team. Uh, what, what's happening there? Um, so I think in a lot of terms, you can think of Artemis being bought out as if Artemis just decided to stop making Damas. Um, if he decided to quit being a Dama company, then his team you know, ceases to exist at that point, unless they want to do it without a flag, right? Um, I don't, as much as I hate to see that they don't have a home, I don't feel like it's my responsibility to just pick them up on a whim. Um, again, going back to why I choose players, it's based on character and personality and how these personal, you know, interactions between me and that person go. Um, and they go on for a while before I'm able to say, this is someone I trust and I would want to bring on board. Mm -hmm. um, so if they ever wanted to be on my team, that would be something that just like everybody else who wants to be on the team, anybody who does, um, it's, a, it's a proving ground. You know, um, I'm not just going to accept that someone else liked you enough to put you on their team because that's someone else's judgment. Totally. So but unfortunately, think, it seems like their team got disbanded even beforehand. I think uh, Zay was pretty open with them and saying he was getting rid of Artemis. Yeah, totally. And, and I think that's, that's the right mindset to have just because they were the right people for a different brand doesn't mean they're the right people for yours, even though now that you quote unquote own that brand, even though you're kind of mm -hmm. dissolving it and you're just keeping the assets from it. Regardless, um, it, it's just interesting to hear your perspective on it. And I think people will want to know kind of some of these answers to it. And yeah. I think it's cool, man. Uh, I'm excited for you. I think that this is something new in the Kanama space that really hasn't been done from what I know of. There isn't really mm -hmm. any other brand that's acquired another Kanama brand that I can recall. I could be wrong. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it, it almost like levels up Kendama to being kind of almost a business entity uh, where mm -hmm. now, oh, maybe Sweets Kendamas goes, oh, we really like what the smaller brand is doing. They have this new paint. Maybe we should reach out and see if we can buy them out for their asset, which is their paint right. or something like that. And, and obviously that's like what big businesses do all the time. Like half of, half of the big businesses in the world don't even create their own stuff. They wait for small indie companies to research and innovate <laughs> something and they try and buy yep. them out before they scale and grow into becoming a big company. That's like, that's like an entire business. Uh, and that hadn't yeah. touched Kendama until, well, now you. And you yeah. kind of paved that, paved that way. I didn't mean to bring the business world out, <laughs> but there is. I mean, look at, look, at, look, at, look at Sweets, look at Chrome. Um, you got to imagine that they have these giant teams, right? Um, and they have these giant behind the scene teams that are keeping this brand running. Um, so there is a business side to it. Um, you think about when I send players products, right? That's my personal money. That's cash out of my pocket for the product, for the shipping. Um, and, and then it's a, it's a, it's a hope that there's going to be a return on the investment. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's in a sponsorship as much as people don't want to maybe not put it in the right context of this. It is a hundred percent a business deal. Um, mm -hmm. you as a player are selling your services to me as a company in return for something, you know what I mean? Um, and there has to be equality on both ends of that deal or else then the deal should not exist anymore. Totally. I did a video on my YouTube channel a couple of weeks back called how to get sponsored by as a Kenoma player or something like that. I think that's the title you can find it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I kind of break that down a little bit in there that from, from an influencer marketing perspective, like that, that's what I do for my, my work full time. It's like, right. I work with influencers, but I will only keep working with that influencer if it's bringing a positive result for our brand that whether or not yeah. that's in the content that we're able to repurpose and use for, for other things or direct sales. Like, is that person driving influence to our brand, driving sales and growing us? Because if not, then I'm just going to keep sending them money and sending them money and sending them product mm -hmm. and sending them product and we're going to get nothing in return. And, and that's not a good business deal. It, yeah. Just, and then at the end of the day, like, good. As a small brand, like my goal is to make it bigger. I want to make New Lace bigger. Um, you know, seeing the little bit of um, influence I've been able to have to kind of bring a more positive light to Kendama, like I want to spread that further. I want to make it bigger. Um, and that, that costs money, that costs time. You know, that's an investment on my behalf to make sure that these things are happening. And as I said, like I'm, I'm a father, um, I have, you know, a, I'm going into my master's program. So I have other things that I do. Um, so I have to make that make sure that I'm making smart business decisions for a new lace. And I thought that acquiring um, an in-house paint, acquiring another shape, um, and uh, 
you know, helping my market in the future was, uh, was going to be the best decision going forward. Because like you said, I gotta, I got, I have to make money to make it bigger. If I want to spread more influence, it's hard totally. to be as influential as possible if you're small, you know? Totally. Yeah. I, I, I 100% agree. Uh, and that, that comes back to like our conversation earlier. It's like, there's not always the right people to sponsor. And I think people don't get that sometimes in the economic community, they like, they don't see it from the brand perspective mm -hmm. that brand needs to be able to grow and sponsorship and all these things are part of that growth journey. And it's not always about what tricks you can do. It's about what value you bring to the brand. And I don't right. think people always see that as clearly as I hope people would see that. So uh, right. if you guys are listening to the podcast, I think you guys get it. <laughs> I've been talking about this for a long time, but it's like my internal gripe with the community. It's like, just because you do cool tricks doesn't mean you, you should right. be sponsored. There's more. Cool tricks are important yeah. though. <laughs> but, no definitely uh being good and having good tricks having a good style that's all very important that's going to get you noticed but what gets you on the team is your character you know what i mean that's i think that's what's that proves who you are and that lets that person on the other side of this equation know i can put my trust in this person mm -hmm. totally so what, what's next what's next for new lace post artemis buyout and you know where, where are you going you started as a conditioner <laughs> company uh, you have grown. They just go back company. to conditioner. Yeah, you can, oh, we'll just get rid of the whole Ken thing. Full circle. Yeah. Um, do you do you think you'll create? Are you first off? Are you still making conditioner for sale? Like, is that still something you do? I do it. Um, I will say that like I haven't pushed it as much. Uh, when I first would only make conditioner, like that was my thing. I was pushing conditioner to try to get people to try it. Um, there's obviously like a love and hate side of this conditioner argument with people like some people really hate it and some people really love it um so there isn't always like a huge demand for it but if someone was to like need some yeah um someone actually hit me up the other day on instagram asking about it and i sent i was going to send him uh just two things of wax that i had that i found that um were able to or anything i was like i'll just send these to you just pay the five dollar shipping um he ended up sending me like enough to cover the cost of it, <laughs> which is very generous. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't look at it as something um, that I want to invest a lot of time into, but if people needed it, I'd be willing to help them out. Cool. Yeah, um, I, so I think, oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, you. <laughs> I think, uh, I think moving forward, what I, what I'm really excited about, um, I mentioned earlier is we have our second Ken shape coming out in August. Um, so this was another one that was kind of in the works. It's going to be called the Sapper. Um, I think you guys would be really excited with what I did with it. Um, it is a spliced style Ken and Tama. Um, I'm super excited. I can't wait to get it in my hands. I'm like a baby. Like, like no, uh, I have no like regulation with this. Like as soon as I've like ordered it, I'm like, when's it going to be here? <laughs> you know? uh, I'll get a Ken in and, or like these Mayflowers in. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to be so happy when they get in and then they get in and I'm like, I'm just ready for the next thing, you know, because <laughs> I just want to see the products keep evolving. Yeah. Oh, I get that. I get that. Dude, that, that's super cool. I'm excited for, for what's to come. Um, you know, I, I like asking all the company owners, uh, when are you coming out with your first coffee mod in, uh, <laughs> so we all, so what I want to know. Dude. Um, you know, I, when, uh, when, Christian Fraser was making all those coffee mods. It had me in the zone that I really wanted to just design a coffee top um, <laughs> because I loved all of the like influences he was bringing in with it. Uh, and I, I also like want to see different um, ways that it can be executed. You know what I mean? Different methods in which you can bring all these pieces together. Uh, so maybe in the future, uh, Cafe Kendama times New Lace Kendama Coffee Mod 2022. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Um, dude, the, I, I have to say, I think coffee and Kendama have become so much more synonymous in the past year. Like uh, there was the Christian Fraser Coffee Mod. There mm -hmm. was the Native uh, Kendama Coffee. Yep, thing. Nativ did that. Uh, Jake Weens came out with a mug and and uh, the coffee scoops. Like all of a sudden, just like mm -hmm. coffee in general has started to like, you know, get into the Kendama community a little bit more. And I'd like to say I own a little bit of that responsibility. Um, in I that. can't think of anyone else who is influencing the coffee Kendama scene more than you. So we'll put that out there. We're working hard. We're working hard. You hear that, Onyx? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, we're, we're working hard. Yeah, I don't know if they listen to the podcast yet, but uh, we're we're working on it. We I want to the hope I actually want to try and like ship out a, a a box of Kanamas to Onyx Coffee Lab. I think that'd be so fun mm-hmm. and just like try, I really want to go to Arkansas and visit them, go to the one of their shops, hang out with them for a day, really get some cool behind the scenes footage, all that stuff. But like we got to work a little bit more on this. I'm hoping that mm-hmm. like I sell enough coffee for them that they're like, yo, this guy's legit. Let's fly him down here and let's yeah, yeah. collab <laughs> on a roast. That'd be so sick. But you know, uh, cafe kendama roast that would sell out immediately. <laughs> <That's the Kendama laughs> community. That'd be kind of cool. I am I'm most keen though on uh, looking at brew battle this year. So um, obviously brew battle was a big thing that I was working on last year around this time, and we ran it in mm-hmm. October. But uh, here's here's the first official word that will be on the podcast on dates. I think mm-hmm. I might have mentioned it last week when I was chatting with Zach Yord. Oh. But uh, September 10th and 12th, or 10th to 12th, but 10th and 11th will be the main days of the event, the 10th yeah. being the pre-party, and there might be some uh, matches that go on that night. We'll see. Uh, and then the the 12th being the, the main comp day. Uh, same venue as last year. It's a really dope place. And now we're starting to work out the details and looking for them sponsors coming up. We're going to be putting out the registration details, all that kind of stuff. And <laughs> hit up new lace. <laughs> uh, we're, hit me we're, up. Dude, it, it's crazy. Uh, putting on an event is not simple, um, but it's mm. definitely worth it. And it is stressful because it's less than two months away and I need to get info out this week. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I watched uh, MJR go through the, the pains of like pushing NAK, NEKC um, and making sure all that stuff is set up. And, you know, I think that you like a lot of things, you put a lot of stress into it because it's something that matters. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're putting your 100 percent and giving your all, I think it's going to come out amazing. Uh, look at how your podcasts have already turned out um, and everything else. So, I mean, just watching how he did that and then seeing that relief when everybody's like, dude, this is the best event of the year so far. You know what I mean? Like, I know. Uh, so get ready for that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so excited, man. I, if the borders open, it's going to be crazy because I think if the borders open and people want to come, I might have to cancel my venue and get a bigger one because the venue that we have <laughs> like caps out at like 125 to 150. We sold out yeah. at 50 people last year, just Canadians within like two days. And, mm. and then so many people are like, oh, I just wish I could have come. Oh, it looks so fun. I'm coming next year, all these things. And so my, my, my like my estimation is we'll hit a hundred this time, but if the borders mm-hmm. open, I have no idea what'll happen. If the borders yeah. open, this might be one of the, the bigger events of kind of the, the late 2021. We'll find out. Never underestimate how far people are willing to drive for a Kendama jam. Uh, both of the first two that I went to were four hours plus for me <laughs> each way. You know? I, drove, I drove 12 hours to go to NACO. <laughs> That's two such a years in a row time. and we just drove 10 hours to go to van jam canadians are built oh different. man we don't yeah. have like we don't have city centers that are close to each other yep. so everything is like 10 hours away see i also know that like i'm in new england so like everything is a couple hours away and uh here in new england everything's a couple hours away and um yeah it definitely seems like people are like i don't want to drive far and it's like 40 minutes you know? <laughs> um, but then you go to like the Midwest and like three hours is like nothing when you're in terms of like what's close, you know, like, can we drive that far? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, man, I'm super excited. I'm hoping that our friends in the States can come up. I'm hoping you can make it up if, uh, if borders oh, man, are open. that'd be awesome. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll be having vending space. We'll be running it up like, like last year. And I like to make brew battle different. I try to make brew battle a place that once you've paid your registration and you're in the doors, everything is accessible to you. Like aside from maybe buying Kendamas from vendors, um, there will be free coffee, uh, sponsored coffee. Last year we had Soul Kendamas as our sponsor for it. They sent out a whole mm-hmm. bunch of Soul Blend, like a massive five pound bag. I was still- Adam lived on that bag. Yeah, I, I drank <laughs> that coffee for probably like a month afterwards because we still had like probably like a pound <laughs> left of it uh, at the end of the night, but we'll see how it goes this year. We're going to hire a barista again. Uh, some videos Ooh. and stuff. I'm really hoping Colin Hislop can make it up so he can film film the event. That would be super sick. I've always wanted a Colin Hislop blog or a Sweets blog or something at Brew Battle. That's like, I just oh. want that so bad. I think that'd be so fun <laughs> to like see the event that I hosted being vlogged. I don't know. Yeah. That's like, that's like my fingers are crossed that that happens this year, but uh, mm-hmm. we'll see. And we'll be running yeah. up on the competition. I actually need to go back and get all the stats from last year on the comp winners and stuff. Uh, Daniel Robinson is doing something with all the comp analytics from the past couple of years. So I need to send him the results. So I got to get, got to get that done today or in the next day or two. 
So mm, yeah, pumps be popping. Uh, no, that's that's awesome. Dude, oh, brew battle, brew battle, brew battle. I got to try to get up for that one. Get yeah. up to the Great North. I used to live real close. I used to live like ten minutes from the border, uh, which okay. was always scary to me because I was in well, I was in Watertown, uh, upstate okay. New York. Okay. It's like over. Yeah, it's, like it's way upstate. Yeah. And so like, if I would have driven too far, like I could have picked Canada. There's a couple of times I almost drove at the border, like getting lost when I first moved to New York. And so I like turned around one of those police checkpoint things. <laughs> like, I don't want to go to the border. <laughs> That's awesome. Somehow get arrested. I know there was like a thing that if you're in the military and you brought any military gear into Canada, you could get fined for each piece of gear, like a hundred dollars. And like, I always had stuff in my cars. So I was like, I'm not trying to go broke just driving into the border. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. That's super crazy. Britta Jacob inadvertently starts a war between the USA and Canada. <laughs> I swear, I was just trying to go to a Kendama jam. Yeah, they're like, spy. <laughs> oh man, well, Jacob, uh, dude, uh, thank you so much for jumping on here. Uh, I'm sure we could talk a lot more about a lot of things here, but I, I think that what we've talked about is super important for the Kendama community to hear. I think there's a lot of people interested in the whole Artemis thing. And uh, I think what you had to say about building a culture from the ground up and building a brand from the ground up uh, is really, really powerful. And I'm excited for people to listen to this, get to know you a little bit more and hopefully board that new lace train because it's a pretty cool one. Yeah, thank you so much, man. Uh, when you first asked me, like I was super excited. I was talking to my wife about it. She's like, you're going to be with Adam. Like she knows we watch this together. Like I'll have, we'll be driving out and like 11 o'clock hits. And I'm like, when we were able to go live, I had my phone and I would just leave it on my lap and listen. <laughs> like we were driving around and stuff. So oh, uh, definitely super excited. And thank you so much for having me be part of this. And let me talk a bunch about things, <laughs> psychology and, and all the good parts of New Lace. So I hope, I do hope that uh, everybody gets a little bit more of a chance to get to know me and understand like my perspective with Kendama um, and what I want to do with my brand, hopefully in the future. Absolutely, man. I uh, always like to leave the ball in my guest's court to wrap up the episode uh, with any words or anything that they'd like to say. You can drop some promo, whatever you want to do. Um, let, let the people know what they need to know. Yeah, so uh, we are about a weekish out from Crown Royale drop. It's a two colorway drop. Uh, you won't want to miss that. It's Maple Can Ash Tama. Um, I try to switch it up. These Mayflowers are Maple Can Beach Tama. I wanted to see what all the different woods work like together and hopefully find things that are closer in weight <laughs> so I can weight match more. Mm -hmm. um, and then in August, we have our, uh, our first splice Ken shape coming out. It's called the sapper. Um, and I hope you guys are really interested in that. We're going to be dropping it in sticky and rubber. So awesome. Well, Jacob, thank you so much for jumping on the preview. Thanks for sharing a cup of coffee with me and we will be back again next week with another episode. So listeners stay tuned, make sure you head over to Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen, hit that like, hit that subscribe, go on YouTube, smash that like button, whatever you do, support the, smash all the buttons. <laughs> yeah, head over to Patreon, do what you do. Um, I love that you're here listening this far into the episode already. So that is enough. Um, but thank you for all your support and head to honestcoffeelab.com, use code brevy 10, whatever you want to do, do it all. We'll catch Thanks. you next week. Jacob, peace. Peace.